Uh, I'm uh, Chris Tice, and I'm the director of the University Writing Program uh, here at UC Davis. And uh, it is my privilege both to welcome all of you to our campus community and to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Barbara Ganley. Uh, I want to mention that her talk is co-sponsored by the National Writing Project and the Davis Humanities Institute. Uh, if you've not been to our uh, Central Valley uh, location before, I hope you are uh, pleasantly surprised by our June combination of hot, sunny days and uh, cool, breezy mornings and evenings. I uh, hope you also uh, will have a chance, a uh, little bit of leisure, to stroll our uh, walking, friendly campus and particularly get a chance to see our Arboretum, uh, plus the, the delights of our college town. Uh, hosting computers and writing is a special privilege for us in the UWP uh, as it shows in a new way our longtime commitment to digital writing and respect for its uses and uh, teaching of writing uh, at all levels in our university, across the curriculum, uh, in the educational communities in the region, state, and actually uh, around the world. Uh, our co-sponsoring last year of the Writing Research Across Borders Conference, which was uh, run so beautifully by our friends at UC Santa Barbara, um, exemplified the theme of this conference in a different way because uh, the growth of international interest in research on writing and the teaching of writing has been brought about by the digital revolution. And conferences such as this one and Writing Across Borders uh, are sparked by the desire of our online communications to meet face to face and to share food and drink and play. And then from this conference, we'll go back to uh, ever richer uh, conversations online and the technologies will keep developing to enable that to happen even, even more richly. Um, no one shows better her respect for the theme of this conference than our speaker this morning, Barbara Ganley. For 19 years, she was a lecturer in writing and literature at Middlebury College, where she directed Middlebury's Project for Integrated Expression. She has been implementing new media and Web 2.0 practices in classrooms for at least the past decade. Barbara has recently founded and directs a new national organization, Centers for Community Digital Learning. On her wide-ranging communal writing space, BG Blogging, she explores, among many topics, theories and practices of teaching and learning through multimedia essays, poetry, and new genres she is continually discovering. Her work is a provocative challenge for all of us in the university and in all educational settings. On BG Blogging, she recently wrote, as the months slip between me and my many years within the safe, question mark, confines of higher education, it is tempting to forget what it was like to work for change from within the system. Honorable and important, frustrating work. I applaud the brave souls who continue to show deep patience and maintain faith that they can bring sense to the academy. The title of this morning's talk is Ecotones and Crossroads, Reimagining the Spaces of Learning in an In-Between Time, a perfect line to inspire our own searches for sense in ever-changing digital and environmental spaces. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Ganley. Thank you. It's a pleasure and it's a privilege to be here. Chris, I appreciate that very kind introduction and Carl, the invitation to come and Leslie Madsen Brooks of UC Davis, one of my great cohorts and colleagues in this work for bringing me here. Before we get started, uh, I want to just forewarn you that this will be quite interactive. I'll have you be doing a lot. I don't believe in being a talking head. I, I never did it when I was a professor. I never do it when I, when I give talks. So the first thing I'm going to ask you all to do is change your seat. Go sit with someone you don't know and move forward so we can really be together. And those of you way on the edges, you're not going to, you're going to have a hard time seeing some of my Thing. So, so everybody up, quick, 
move, and we'll get going. Before we get started with my story and with what I would like to share with you today and the kinds of questions I'd like to ask, I'd like you to, to uh, write for a moment. After, after all, having been a writing teacher for 25 years, I can't help myself. If you have Twitter, I would really like you to do it on Twitter, so you have to limit yourself to 140 characters. The rest of you be brief in your notebooks or wherever, so you don't get an advantage. And if you are doing it on Twitter, use the hashtag, please, CWO9. And then um, after that, I'd like you to write, um, for this one, Ecotone. So C hashtag CWO9, Ecotone. And I would like you to write the story of your own interaction, your own experience in ecotones or crossroads, please. Terrific. How many of you were, what you, what you were talking about was you did not know what the heck an ecotone was? I know Mikhail doesn't know. Yeah. It's a fantastic space between biological communities. It's the overlapping spaces between. We often talk about borders and boundaries in comp and ret, but I love the term ecotone because it's much more amorphous. You know, a boundary or border is a straight, is a line, whereas an ecotone is a space. And I think that's a really nice place to be. And we're familiar with being in those spaces because we're in writing. Because we are the ones who so often in the academy have gone between the disciplines, between the departments, the classrooms, and between the worlds of inside and outside. And now that we have the possibilities of using social media, our reach and the crossings are ever more vast and ever more close as well, small, narrow, depending on how you participate in these spaces. My own experience with ecotones has to do with having been a writing teacher since the 1980s when I was very well, completely immersed in the writing process of Peter Elbow, Donald Murray, Donald Graves, Lucy Calkins, all of the great writer, writing process teachers then. And then in 2001, I got very involved in blogging in my classrooms. And as my students did all of their work out in the world in a transparent, connected space, it became impossible to stay in the classroom anymore. And so 10 years later, as I started to participate more and more in local community and global community with my students, the boundaries, the borders, the walls that I encountered were within the academy, not out. And so what I'd like to do today, explore with you is, OK, ubiquitous computing. We know about this. We absolutely are comfortable with this. We know about what's going on outside the world with writing and computing through organizations such as this, the network protests of Moldova that went on on Twitter, whatever's going on in Iran, whatever's going on on Twitter about Iran. We don't know yet if that's being dominated or worked over by any particular entity or if that's authentic. Cell phones, micro-lending, Brooklyn Art Museum, how they get the people of the, of the city to have an opportunity to participate in the programming. And yet we in the academy so often continue, continue to inhabit a world where there's a huge semantic gap between us and the world. We continue to use academic terminology and erudite discourse when the rest of the world is out there on Facebook and texting. 
What do we as writers, what do we as writing teachers do about all of this? Well, we know that learning to write is a matter, as Maxine Green has told us, of learning to shatter the silences. We know this, but do we do it? Do our students and ourselves, are we writing to change the world? Are we writing to change ourselves? Or why are we doing this at all? It's puzzling sometimes. We're comfortable in those spaces, or are we? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that we've actually progressed much further than the model of education that we went to school in. I am not convinced that what we see in digital media and social media use in writing classrooms across this fair country is more than that. Are we dressing up the same old practices in new clothes? Are we asking our students to evolve? And are we espousing and embracing progressive pedagogy when in reality we truly do believe in the same academic essay being assigned our students again and again and again and again? Is this really? what we're asking. I was just at the University of British Columbia the last couple of days, and I listened to students speak there about their experience in the classroom and in writing. And they said, they, in their own personal learning environments, this new PLE term, they do all kinds of stuff online, but the only things they do online for school are the things they know are going to get them better grades that it's all about the grade. And yet we know that students are doing really interesting things outside the classroom. They're making crazy videos. Two students, Middlebury students, made this incredible video. And I have all of this on this Prezi. And you can go back to it and look at some of these videos at your own, in your own time. But these students made a video during the election it was rather irreverent about being Russian, pretending they were Russian, and singing to Mrs. Palin. But it has over 500,000 views, and it's incredibly well put together and fun. When's the last time you had fun with writing? When's the last time your students had a gas with writing? Why is it that those students at UBC said, oh, just tell me what to do and I'll do it better than you've ever seen it done before, but tell me what to do? Why is it my own daughter who goes to a college in a consortium of five fantastic schools and let this last semester took four courses for in different institutions had exactly the same assignments? These are supposed to be some of the greatest teachers in this country. And they still couldn't get past, let's assign a whole lot of reading and ask them to think deeply and carefully and passionately for Tuesday. And then for Thursday, something else. And then you write a paper on top of all that. And the first one's five pages, and the second one's five pages, and the third one's 10 pages, and then you got the whammy research paper at the end. Every single course. That's the way it was when I went to school in the 1970s. We didn't have computers then. What has changed? Bell Hooks does tell us that we do embrace progressive pedagogy, but we do not essentially change enough. Those of you doing interesting P bits and pieces with social media, are you still evaluating your students according to the old standards? 
Are you still looking for the same things? Are you still, are you talking about formative and summative feedback? But the students know it's really about the grade. So yeah, we'll do what you asked with a little digital on the side, if that helps. We'll do what you ask if this reflective piece you're asking us to do counts. What are we really asking and what are we really doing? Well, bell hooks again. She would say we have this loss of feeling of connection and closeness with the world beyond. As we continue to hang on to fossilized discourse modes, we are, why are we training 100% of our students for a profession that less than 10% of them will pursue? They are not going to be academics. Thank goodness. John Galbraith says, when we are faced with the choice between change and the proof that it is not necessary, we all get very busy with the proof. Chris Deedy says it's easier to change or move a cemetery than an academic institution. Clay Shirky tells us the systemic bias for continuity creates tolerance for the substandard. Don't you love this Prezi? Chris Lott. If you don't follow his blog, you all ought to. If you didn't hear his keynote at TTIX, you all go, should go and listen to it. But he talks about what we're guilty of is a quantity of lightweight engagements. We don't ask our students to engage in passionate work with what writing really is. Why is it in my new work in communities, small rural communities, I'm working with them in storytelling and civic engagement and digital exploration, why is it they're so scared at the beginning? I'm not a writer, everyone says. I'm not a storyteller, I have no stories. Why is it when I gave a workshop about youth storytelling for youth and adults, everyone who showed up were young parents with toddlers who were hoping that I was going to show them how to tell better stories to their kids. And I said, what are you talking about? Let's tell stories, kids. And we did. And the parents watching their children tell stories had a lot to learn. Why is it a 13-year-old in that same town told me, oh, I used to love writing, but now I love making videos. Writing's just for school. Videos are for me. Are we so concerned with speed and scale? Why in higher ed have we not paid more attention to some of the innovative work that's going on in K through 12 in spite of no child left behind? What's our excuse? Not you guys. I'm not gonna do this one yet. I change my mind when I go. Here's, I wanna just go through a couple of things quickly with you in terms of how I urge you to think about what these beautiful, wonderful sessions and pieces that I'm, I'm seeing on the program that you're all going to be engaging in. And there's clearly some terrific innovation going on amongst this group. But I'm going to, what I want to push at today is how are you doing this to make, to bring about better worlds? How are you doing this to bring your students into their local communities authentically, how are you doing this to reach out across the world? Now what most people do when they say they're doing digital writing is they're really doing print-based. They're really in the Gutenberg thrall. And so papers look almost identical and they're just handed in in doc or PDF and the professor is the one who reads it, or there's some kind of 
of peer review that now, in the 80s, that was exciting because it meant something. Now it's just pro forma. And the kids kind of, that, and they have identified, self-identified already as writers or non-writers. As successful or not successful. Why is it we do not write well as a country? Horrific. We're not, even what we're doing isn't working. And if we're asking our students to write these kinds of papers that do not promote the depth of thinking because they're only doing it to get a grade. They forget how the next day. You all should have a Okay, so I, you know, I, I tend to get very passionate and fired up about this and fiery about this, but then I like to pull it way around and say, where's the joy, where's the fun? Let's have some fun right now. Wanna we're gonna play a little game right now. And you, have, you each have an image? You all have an image? Great. I want you all to look at this image and I want you to, and if you have paper, write down. If you don't have paper, then in your head, a metaphor that this image could create for you about this moment in the teaching and learning of writing. This moment in time about the world of, that you all are immersed in. How can you conjure up a metaphor out of this wacky picture you have in your hands that, okay? All right, did everybody get, did everybody get something interesting? You certainly are chattering away very intensely and you're sitting around people you don't know. Anybody get something interesting out of the, what was the difference between the first one and the second one? What's the difference between the one that you did all by yourself and then the one that you built on what someone else did? What's the difference in that experience? Right. So in some ways, when you're building on what someone else has said or on a text of some sort, you, you go a little further down the road than you might have gone by yourself. Did you find that, that the second one you did, the second one you did was more interesting than the first one you did? Or do we have some solo artists out there? Yeah. Okay, so how did that feel? <laughs> right. How did that feel? Oh, like the whole of our lives. <laughs> He's not a plant. Other responses? Right. Exactly. So these simple little exercises, when we rely on kind of canned discussion, that we are directing, that's adjacent monologue we get. They're directing their discussion to us, and they're not paying attention to each other. How many classroom situations, discussion classes are that? The kids can't wait to say something, the five who get A's, and the rest of them say, there's just no way, there's just no way. I got nothing to add to this. You know, how are we actually forming community? We have to make writing safe. We have to go back to the joy of writing. One of the reasons we, we, that distinguishes us as a species is that we tell stories. Stories are how, what help us bond. Stories are help us uh, build bridges. And stories help us transmit culture. Why have we forgotten the power of story 
the power of our story and the building of story and the communal, the beginning of community in just playful exercises where there is no grade. But it's to get to know each other, it's to trust each other, it's to be playful with each other. Other experiences in that that are different from what we just had? Pretty much the same kind of thing? And imagine if you were doing that with a lot of students, and imagine if the students were actually coming up with the exercises. Believe me, theirs will be better than yours. At least mine always were. My students came up with fabulous things. Fabulous things. So what do I mean by deeply digital? This is what I want to propose to you today, that we really all try to be and do. Deeply digital rather than half digital or sort of kind of digital, and why would we want to be that? First of all, Howard Rheingold talks about mindful connectivity. I am not embracing being online all the time, even though we live in an age of ubiquitous computing. What I do embrace is mindful connectivity. When we are on with our students, when we are engaging them with the world this way, we're doing so carefully. We're doing so for a reason. We're doing so because there's no better way to do what we're trying to do. My students, when I was teaching, they could use any media they wanted to as long as they could argue that they needed it. So if they only wrote with text, they had to defend that choice. Why didn't you use video? Why didn't you use audio? Do you think Shakespeare would have only used text if he had digital storytelling? Why aren't you doing a digital story? Audience. Deep, being deeply digital means being aware of your audience, being aware that you have, that your community has warped into audience. People no longer want to be famous for 15 minutes. They want to be famous for 15, to 15 people, Dave Weinberger tells us. Isn't that true? Why are people showing up at rallies with their cell phone cameras taking pictures of politicians? Because they think they're going to take a good picture with their cell phone like this? but because they want to participate. They're there. This whole vernacular creativity and participation. So how does that affect our students in the classroom if they're participating in these really dynamic, staccato, syncopated ways outside? What does that have to do with these long papers we're asking them to write in class? Are we asking them to write in different ways for different audiences? How many of you have your students write on Twitter? Wow. Why not? What's wrong with Twitter? How many of you have an opinion about Twitter? Come on, put your hands up. You all have an opinion about Twitter. Half of you use it. Why wouldn't you use it in a teaching situation? Yeah, there are. 140. When could that serve you well? I'm worried about domesticating. You're worried about domesticating it. Oh, you're a purist, a renegade, a rebel. Don't, you're, you've got a student attitude. Do not mess with my social media. You have an attitude, just like they do, that these two worlds don't coexist. They coexist in, 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 in parallel universes, but they shouldn't be this. What a waste. I'm not, not trying to be. <laughs> Twitter. How can you use Twitter in a classroom? Who, who does use it? You, you can't, you, no one has, okay, everybody, right now. I want you to brainstorm an assignment in your class where you could see that this synchronous tool that the entire class could use, either synchronously or asynchronously, 
that you can only use 140 characters for a single post, how could you use that in a way that would help you bring together community or create bonds and bridges with the outside world or share knowledge or practice concision or collaborative storytelling. We heard of Renga. What if everybody's writing a poem together? Or what else? Okay, is everybody everybody come up with one? Who's gonna who's gonna share? Yes. Elevator pitches. elevator pitches. Those of you who, who do teach speech, elevator, the elevator pitch, okay. What else? Who's got another one? Over here? Yep. Um, having students uh, with, uh, find good quotes in the middle of a uh, community event, sending a reporter out to a community event with facts, direct quotations, or statements saying something good is happening over here, I need a photographer over here, or there's good audio over here. Okay, so it's a great way just to make that kind of contact to make arrangements and organize. Absolutely. What else? Exactly. Twitter is a great tool for bringing back to your community what you're finding out out there. Okay, yes. I, from, in the future, I will. You, you need a mic next time you speak. Um, yeah. Okay, I hear you. But it's on, but oh, I, and I'm down with you, and this group knows that I'm not one to turn down technology. But you, but you just said five minutes ago, why mandate anything in the classroom? Why, why have my students use Twitter when they're going to use Twitter on their own anyways? When they're going to use it in their final projects, regardless of whether I'm saying you need to use Twitter for your assignment? Well, that's a really good point. This is, what I'm doing is talking about playful exercises that we're working on because I think I believe in practice. I believe that we don't all we don't all come to all the tools equally. We won't be our own styles, our preferences, our interests, our abilities. We'll we'll separate which tools make sense for us. But I do believe that a classroom is a place where we can safely experiment and experience the use of these tools in a way that we can help them see how they might help them think more deeply connect more effectively, and be more creative. Okay, let's, let's, let's continue on. Reflection. I believe wholeheartedly in reflection. I'm known as a slow blogger. Believe me, we, you know, here we're joking around about Twitter. I'm a slow blogger. That means I blog infrequently and long. The long post blogger. I believe that students, that we ask students to reflect, lots of times what we're doing is we're creating e-portfolios and we're then at the end say, reflect back over the semester. Tell us what you've learned, think about what you've learned, because you're hoping that that will cement the learning. But I believe in reflecting as you go, reflecting as you're learning, reflecting in that raw moment of discovery when everything is confusing. That's the potential moment of setting something on fire. And so the, the, the kinds of reflection that we can use are not just writing in a journal for ourselves or our teacher, even our classroom, but it is a transparent, linked kind of reflection because we're actually participating in the world at the same time. It's writing letters to the self. It's writing letters to the self, which can be fantastic. And this is what a student said about that experience. So reflecting online, digital reflecting allows us to do things that reflecting offline cannot do. We, it connects. We can link out to the text that we're thinking about, that we're reflecting on. We can link to the other students' work in the class, and we can comment on it. 
We can have reflectionist conversation. We can't really do that. I'm a problem. <laughs> I've been told that many times. How many of you use reflective practices in your classes? How many of you use digital reflective, linked blogging, reflective practices, and have found that it works this way? It also builds that community. Again, that safe place where every student, no matter the ability, feels safe to contribute. So reflection is very important and deep, deeply digital. And the connection. But what we often do is we connect only in that semester, only in that class. Are you connecting semester to semester? Are you, are you connecting across the university? Are you asking the students to take what they're doing in one class and bringing it in? Are you asking them to be authentic and not just isolate this moment of engaging with the material that you're do asking them to? What does this have to do with your life? What does this have to do with the world? What does this have to do with your community? We, primary schools do this very well. They're constantly asking the kids to say, have you ever seen a caterpillar? Can you bring one in from your garden? And we go, do you have any experience with Shakespeare? Have you got any of these kinds of, of, of experiences with Irish Little? What's your Joycean moment? No, we don't ask that. <laughs> we also, if we connect, experts can join the class serendipitously because lots of published people actually Google themselves and they come across student work if you keep it out on the web. And they will come in and visit your class. We've had, I've had, I had that happen many, many times, where a writer, a filmmaker would come in. But you can also ask experts in your field to come in. I taught in a rural state. It was, it was very difficult to get out. I taught Irish literature. I couldn't take my students to Ireland, though I actually did. They actually took me, and it has to do with all this digital work. But they can come in and participate. This is a course I was teaching on arts writing. And I had a composer, an art gallery owner, um, an, um, an art dealer, and an artist join us. And this is the composer ask, joining in the blogging. And the kids got to participate. Contact zones. One of the issues we have right now with being online all the time is that is we're actually segregating ourselves into affinity groups. And that what we're doing is we're entering little echo chambers. And we're only joining up with people we know and we like and we, who, th who think like us. In this country, if you, read, if, if you read Frank Rich's column in the Sunday Times a couple of weeks ago about the hate crimes that are going on in this country, that's pretty scary stuff. And the willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. I only want to believe what I want to believe. So how do you use the writing to help us break down the walls of willful ignorance by bringing these students directly into contact with each other and with the world? Catherine Hales tells us that to see electronic literature only through the lens of print is in a significant sense not to see it at all. How many of you have your students writing critical essays that incorporate a lot of different media? I mean critical essays, not creative works where they're just doing whatever they want, but critical essays where they're using a lot of different kinds of digital social media. Raise your hands. If we have the opportunity to show something or hear it, why wouldn't we do that if it makes sense for that argument? We study more and more and more the scholarship online is in multiple media. Why aren't we doing that with our students? The University of Virginia's Digital History Project 
has students going out into the very tiny little town offices all around rural Virginia, going through the primary resources, the old ledgers, the old documents, finding out the actual history of the emigration of the African American after emancipation. And the white Americans response to that. They're rewriting that history. Undergrads, by going and doing that, digitizing it, and creating visualizations. Writing about it. Amazing. Creation. How much do we ask our students to fail and fail gloriously? I always tell my students if they didn't fail, I was failing. And if I didn't make an idiot out of myself half the time, there was something wrong. Because it didn't mean I was trying hard enough. This is the second time I've used this presentation tool. The, second, the first time was two days ago. I try to push myself to understand things better, not to use whizzy tools, but to find things that help me deepen myself as a thinker. How many, are, do you guys push yourselves? Are you practitioners? Are you digital practitioners? Are you teaching digitally? Yeah, you are, because you're in computers and writing. But if you're not digital practitioners, if you're not out there playing, then you can't find these ways to help our students. Uh, that's a piece you can go and watch it that one of my students made. But then I want to show you that they shocked me with their, their own creativity. This is a single student. Examining Jack Kerouac by finding old images of him in archive.org over there, way over on the side, and then pulling that onto VoiceThread, finding him reading some of his work that was online and it was, you know, copyright free, had, had it come into VoiceThread, and then he, the student, talked back to Kerouac, built on Kerouac, started to play with Kerouac. And then other students came in and left their voice on it. How much more did he learn about Kerouac and retain it and feel it in his heart than if he had written a paper on Kerouac? Then he, this kid played around with a lot of things. I want us to play around now. Again, this time digitally. How many computers do we have? I mean, well, I don't, you know, if you have your computers out, everyone, if you don't have a computer, go sit near somebody. So raise your hand if you have a laptop that you got hooked up to the web. Okay, so find somebody where you guys can cluster around right now. All right, here we go. If you see here on Flickr, how many of you use Flickr as a photo site? It's really a fun place to go and leave your have your pictures if you want to share them. This is that same student who did the Kerouac. All they, it was a creative writing class. They were just writing poems, whatever they wanted to do. And this guy did this. He went to Flickr and wrote notes as a poem. And what's interesting about it is that you can kind of read it in lots of different ways. Now, if the class, it would have been really interesting if the class had continued to build that. And in, there was one comment, but it, you can create different kinds of work on the same image. Actually, you know why they couldn't? Because they couldn't write on his. That's one thing about Flickr. You, I no, you can leave notes on other people's, can't you? So I want those of you who have a Flickr account to go into a Flickr picture of your own. Or you can go into mine. I have that all set up. So you would go to flickr.com for photos BG. Or you can go into your own, it doesn't matter. And I want you to start playing around with how, what you might write on this. What kind of a note? What would you insert in this image or whatever image you choose that would make it more than just words on an image 
but together they create more than the sum of their parts, if you get what I mean. Why would we have students do this? Keep working at it, and as you're doing it, think about what, what does this have to do? Is this just a silly exercise? Why should I care? I teach, I teach a different kind of writing. This is fine for you. You teach creative writing. What does this have to do with what I'm up to? Do you know that they do this in medical schools? Medical professors put up an image, and then the students have to label it with notes on Flickr. All right, this is just, just little tastes of things, just little ripples of if we have taught our students again and again for years since they were in probably fifth grade how to put a sentence together, a paragraph, an essay, and they still can't do it by the time they graduate from college, is there something wrong with our students? or something wrong with our approach. So what can digital media do for us that can help pull us out of the rut, have students engage with the material in meaningful ways that then they can bring to bear on the kinds of writing that they need to do? That's the question. So, I want to leave time for you to talk, for us to talk, but I want to, I'm just going to show you this little um, piece I made. One of the complaints that a lot of the researchers in schools of ed are coming to is that we're asking students to present material in a single way, to a very simple way to a single audience. Whereas now we have audiences out in the world who are real, that if our students are actually writing to more than a teacher or the fellow students, can have an impact on the world and can have an impact on them as writers. How many, you know, have you had students have this experience where they've written something that's actually authentic and they put it out in the world and they feel as though this makes all the difference and suddenly they like to write? So here's just an example of, of how um, I play around with these, whoops, with these tools. Because I'm really interested, and we didn't do anything with the audio really today, but with image and text. So I'd like to invite, we have a mic out in the back of the room, and I'd like to invite you to think about this aspect of audience being beyond our classrooms. Think about what happens when we try out some of these new digital media practices as exercises, and then we add the whole reflective, deep reflective practice connective practice and the collaboration that's possible in a classroom, not in the traditional ways we've been doing, but in the ways that the digital afford us. 
that we never could do before. Where's, do you want to push back a little bit? Who's sitting here going, there's no way? We can do little bits and pieces, but we can't do this holistically the way you're asking us. Yes, hang, hang, you have to wait. Um, uh, this, okay. um, I, I hear a lot of what you're saying, and I, I, I hear a lot of conversations going on in the background on Twitter um, from people who are saying, we, we, we hear what you're saying, and we are adapting some of these technologies. I think, I think I'm primarily more interested in um, not so much, I'm primarily interested in figuring out what to do as opposed to figuring out, you know, where we're going. I think it's clear that we, we know where we're going. Now it's time for us, for me it feels like, uh, to figure out what we're going to do right now with what we have, whether it be a crayon or <laughs> Twitter, but how it is that I'm going to use it that, and how is it that I'm going to assess it. That, that, those are the thoughts that are coming up to me. Well, assessment's a great question asked about, did it, any of you wonder how all of this, you know, you're doing all this wild stuff, how, how can this possibly be assessed? How can this possibly be, you know, first of all, how do you put all these things together right now to create critical writing that you're being required to do, or expository writing, or research, or what, whatever it is you're being asked to do? What, how do you put all these pieces together? I turn the responsibility over to the students a great deal. Say, you have something that you're trying to say. Connect with it deeply and passionately. Find your own way into it. We've been playing with these tools. Experiment, explore with how they might help you or not help you. You may not want any of them, as I said. How do we evaluate? Somebody want to take that on? Somebody who's been doing this a great deal? How do we evaluate these new kinds of works and these processes? If a kid says, I'm going to use a crayon because this is going to be better because of X, Y, and Z, and then you go, oh my goodness, how do we do that? Carl. Sure, I'll take a shot at it. What about electronic portfolios and the notion of reflection? I've been thinking a lot um, about what you've been saying and some of Kathy Yancey's work on electronic portfolios. It seems to me that a way in which we could respond to this is have the students reflecting on their multimodal compositions. Whether they're doing, the, and I think the interesting question, and what I'd love to hear you respond to, is should that reflection be textual reflection? Should it be alphabetic reflection? Or should it be multimodal reflection? That is, when they're reflecting on an image and a multimodal composition, is it important for them to reflect on that in textual form? or should they be reflecting on it in a multimodal form? Well, my own take on that is they should reflect on it in the way that allows them to best express that reflection on the piece. I'm not, I, I, I'm very, I've always been very loose with my students on the best way. Some, as you saw, some students are reflecting orally, some in text, some will create a movie reflection. And that, again, if they can, express why they needed to reflect that way. In terms of um, reflection, we generally use reflection for students to get a say and we may accord them a certain percentage of the grade with their reflection. I have my students create the rubrics for the course where I had them. They had to decide what was it together we were trying to accomplish. What would look like success at the end of this course. If I'm telling them that and I'm giving them all the hoops, then again, they, that's external, that's not internalized. It's not really meaningful. They, that's when they just jump through your hoops instead of saying, I need to learn how to do this. Oh, I need how to learn how to do this in order to be able to express myself clearly and able to um, really show a deeper understanding of something than I had before. And as a group, they come up with that. And then they decide 
individually and together what they think that their grades will be, and then they have to defend that. I do a lot of, um, or I did, a lot of um, work with my students in terms of having them have to argue for something, having them to have to really take responsibility. Other ideas? Yeah, um, I have a question over here, um, or a question or a thought or something about assessment. When we start playing with these tools, you know, I don't know that I need to bring Twitter in the classroom to get the students to use it or any of the uh, uh, digital media that they're playing in already, and I want to be able to allow them to play. But as soon as I bring assessment into it, even um, in the kind of self-assessment that you've described, then we bring in that whole load of systemic problems that you discussed earlier that we're all trying to avoid. Uh, it, it's not fun, or even if they are designing their own set of criteria, they're doing it in such a way that they think will please me or the system or what they've been taught uh, uh, their assignments need to do. So I, as I wrestle with the ideas that you're discussing, I just don't know how I can bring evaluation into the equation at all without, you know, ruining the whole process. Well, I talk with them up front and, and say that exactly to them, that this is something I struggle with and this is something that we're required to do in a very quick, you know, so we get that over with. But the best evaluation that I've seen the students do is how are you using this out in the world? It's that self-evaluation. That's for them. Are you going to go on and do something meaningful with the skills that you've gained in this class. And the, the numbers of students who have walked out of these experiences doing actually incredibly remarkable things that are meaningful to them through the use of this and their own self, sense of self-transformation, that's the, all the assessment and evaluation they need. But the university, of course, is requiring some. And we talk about the differences between those two and the tensions between those two. And I think that's life. And you have to talk about those tensions because there are always going to be those tensions. To them. something, And if I get students to really do something that matters to them, then I guess we have those institutional tensions that you discussed. Well, if they're and doing do something that they, that if all? they get really passionate about it and they're really pushing themselves to grow, they're actually going to exceed the, the university requirements for them anyway. My students started to win all the college prizes for their writing with all this wild stuff against the traditional papers. They were winning the college-wide writing prizes. What better proof is that to the institution that this is well done? So anyway, we have to be, we're all done. One more. one more. We've got one more. Time for anybody else have something to say? I just stupefied you. Yeah. Just on, on the general issue of assessment, we have a history of this in our field. Um, Wayne Butler and Bill Condon published Writing the Information Superhighway as a textbook many years ago that was based on students building digital portfolios in native web environments and in, in the, when they used the book in the course, students were developing criteria for those things because they were new, working with professors to express those. And then in the end, one of the things Wayne did that I ended up doing was students would write an argument for the grade yeah. in the course based on meeting the criteria, not based on A for effort. Yeah. And with contract grading, you give students a baseline grade for doing all the work, and they have to articulate what they learn, drawing on their own work as evidence. And when I do that assignment with my students, I say, you know, when you go up for tenure review, if you're an academic or a job performance review, this is what you're doing. So right. those things are very clear, and it grows out of the natural things we've been doing anyway. Right, and the self-reflection is, is tied into that self-evaluation, that can be, um, um, it, it means more, the, the reflective piece means more to them because they're saying, oh, this is what I accomplished and how I did, and I, and I can link that to all of the various pieces inside. Well, I hope that, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing the sessions 
um, these next couple of days and to hearing more about what you're, in, you're doing individually. Because I, my new work, working with communities, I need you all to help. I need you to help inside the academy so that when people leave school, that they're, that they're, they're not, their relationship to it isn't that, that sort of this numbed space of, oh, school. And a lot of people do feel that way. And schools should be one of the extraordinary opportunities of our lives to take time out from the busy fray, to take time away from all the other competing demands in our lives, to have this amazing opportunity to explore and to experiment, to create, to fail, to have a blast with ideas and people. And if, if we can do that job better inside the academy, and you are the most, you are so well positioned to be doing that because you already understand this as you're in writing. And we've always been on the margins. And now, and now if we can just get the word out, I, I really look forward to you making my job absolutely obsolete. So, thank you so much. And anyone want to talk? Oh, you have one. Just, just one item. Um, when we work in classrooms, we work within an overdetermined system. And when we work in institutions, we do as well. And when you talk about making a classroom a space or an institution a space where students can play and take risk and have fun, I don't think there would be anybody here who would argue with you, but pragmatically, we've seen students who have to maintain a GPA for a Pell Grant, or who have to maintain a GPA for a um, scholarship. We live in an overdetermined system that where students have to earn a living, may hold down two jobs or three jobs in order to let them come to school. So while I think you're preaching to a converted choir on most of your, um, most of your activities and curriculum, I don't think um, maybe it's acknowledging the difficulties and challenges that students face when they're in an academy that is uh, enmeshed in these kinds of overdetermined systems. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think that's a, that's a terrific comment. I think that is up to each one of us as individuals in our classrooms and in our institutions to push for change every day in every way we can while acknowledging the difficulties and the barriers. I, I beat my head against the wall for 20 years and finally decided I could do better outside and coming in it from, to, from that perspective. But I do believe that the kinds of practices I'm asking us to, to think about and embrace will help the students do those things they've been required to do. They'll do them better. The, the results will be better, and they will be happier doing them. It won't be mind-numbing, and they'll actually make far more progress as writers. So I think it's a win-win situation. I'm not trying to be utopian or Pollyannish about this at all, because I do understand the difficulties about the institutions. The preceding program was brought to you by UC Davis on iTunes U. Please visit us at itunes.ucdavis.edu.